focus on business and science policy. Um, and I'm quite used to being the rather boring candidate that gets to speak when Boris uh, can't make it. Um, and people always expect, you know, Boris's humour and his fame and his hair, and I don't have, have any of that, so I'm, I'm sorry to, to disappoint you. Um, and he has set the bar rather high, I must say. We, uh, my team back at City Hall were saying to me, you know, keep it light, keep it funny, this is what people want, they've got a long day and they don't want to hear a boring speech. And my problem is I don't have Boris's innate um, sense of humour, uh, so there's a lot of pressure to, um, to be funny, and I, I, I just struggle with that. I, I yearn for the days when people who work in politics could just get up and speak authoritatively and tell you what's what, and then you could pelt us with fruit and eggs and we could all go home. But um, now it's, uh, there's the pressure to be an entertainer as well as, as saying something intelligent. So I, I was thinking to myself, what is it that I could offer um, you today? Uh, quite often when I, I give speeches, I talk about why London is such a great place to invest, why it's a, a business-friendly environment, uh, and I make those sort of arguments, but I don't think anyone in this room needs to hear that. Uh, I'm sure you all have a, a London connection in some way. Virtually all business that's done in the UK does come through London in some way or another. Um, uh, and, that's, and that's a good thing. We really do make the argument that a strong uh, UK needs a strong capital city and, and vice versa. So um, I'm not really going to talk about why London is such a, a great place for you to business and to invest. I'm sure you know that. I'm also not really going to go on about what a fantastic model the social stock exchange is, because you all know that, you're all involved with it in one way or another. Um, and, and so there's, there's really no point me um, belaboring that point. I am hugely uh, fond of the, the social stock exchange. Patrick Burley, I'm not sure if he's here today, but Patrick Burley from ICAP first introduced me to the idea of the social stock exchange, and since then I've been absolutely hooked. I think it's fantastic, and I want City Hall now and in the future to do a lot more with it. Um, before I start, I will just uh, name check, if I could, a couple of businesses that we've worked with that are involved with the, the Social Stock Exchange. Um, ITM Power, I'm not sure if ITM Power are here today. Unfortunately, they had to call off the last one. That's a pity. ITM Power have worked closely with City Hall on our project to have more hydrogen refueling stations around London. We now have, I believe we have six hydrogen refueling stations around London, including a, a forecourt in Hendon, and ITM Power have been been great on that. If you're not familiar with, with benefits of hydrogen power, I'd encourage you to look into that. It's an amazing source. The chairman of Toyota has said that he thinks hydrogen will be, and I quote, the most important fuel source uh, for the next century. Um, so it's definitely worth looking into. The other company I wanted to mention was uh, Good Energy. Which yeah. We have Good Energy here today. But they are brilliant. Uh, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my researchers tell me that Good Energy is the only company listed on the um, social stock exchange that is an accredited living wage uh, employer. They, they're accredited to pay the living wage. If that's not right, please raise your hands and we'll, we'll get that corrected. Um, the living wage, as you may well know, uh, recognises the fact that um, people need uh, to earn more than the minimum wage in order to have an acceptable standard of living, particularly in London where the cost of living is so expensive. Many of you may well pay the living wage to everyone that you employ already. Uh, but as I understand it, Good Energy is the only one that's been accredited uh, and, and checked to do that. If you think you do pay the living wage and you'd like to be accredited, I'd highly encourage you to do that because it's, um, we're certainly very keen to encourage and boast about companies such as Good Energy <coughs> for that process. Um, so when I thought about what I, I could sort of offer you uh, from, a, from a political office perspective, uh, I thought to myself that perhaps the most useful thing I can offer is um, a bit of advice on how to engage politicians and policy makers, regulators, and people who work in the kinds of, of fields that I do. Um, now this may seem uh, an obvious point, but you'd be surprised how many businesses uh, forget this. And, and that is that policy and politics, which obviously influences policy, is not a, a logical sport. It is an emotional sport. And you'd be surprised how many businesses I meet um, who think that the logic of their argument, whether it's an argument on regulation, whether it's an argument on tax policy, they think that having the logic right should therefore automatically flow through and policy will, uh, will fall into line with that. And it's, it's really not politics and therefore the policies that emanate from it. Uh, it's very much an emotional sport. Um, it's driven very much by what people feel. You only need to look at, uh, uh, and I don't mean to be party political, but certainly the Jeremy Corbyn 
um, rise in the Labour Party. I think even his team would, would probably admit that a lot of the arguments that he makes are about emotion and about how people feel and people feel angry about this or people feel that they want change on that. Um, so I, I don't think it, it doesn't discredit to say that uh, he's tapping into an emotional feeling as, as much as uh, uh, logic. And it's true for the other side of politics as well. You, know, you, you debate with people who are um, sometimes deeply Eurosceptic and although they'll start with some quite logical arguments, fairly soon uh, you know, it's revealed that th there's an emotional aspect to it. People feel um, uh, strongly about UK sovereignty, um, and, and that's an emotional thing. And, and even though if we're going to continue to trade with Europe, we will need to abide by many of the, the regulations coming out of Brussels, that emotional uh, need for, to, to restore what's perceived as a, a loss of sovereignty is very much there. So the, the prevailing logic, which I'm sure you all realize is completely uh, wrong, but the prevailing argument, quite often, is that economic growth and profit uh, are somehow in opposition to um, environmental sustainability and social uh, responsibility. I know that everyone in this room knows that that's not true, but the prevailing logic in the media and in much political discussion is that you need to trade one off uh, for the other. You need to forego some profit in order to be more socially responsible and vice versa. And, and we know that that's not true. Uh, just this week, The Economist magazine did a very interesting piece on India, and they showed how India has become cleaner as it has become wealthier. And a more historical example, Japan, after the Second World War, Japan was, uh, had a lot of highly polluting industries. Uh, as Japan became wealthier, eventually one stage the wealthiest country on earth per capita, it became much more green. Uh, and today, uh, uh, putting Fukushima aside, the rest of Japan is absolutely spotless and, and fish have returned to the rivers and it's, it's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Um, so we know that becoming wealthier and pursuing profit can work very much with environmental sustainability and social responsibility. But that argument's not always out there. And my call to you is, in engaging with uh, politicians and with policymakers, you're going to need to make that argument. And unfortunately, you're going to have to make that argument again and again. Quite often people think, make the argument once you've won the, you've won the debate and settle back. But policymakers change, politicians change. Uh, it is an argument that you'll never completely win. You have to keep making that argument. And that would be my, my urge to you. From my office, we, we're looking forward to the uh, May 20th, uh, 2016 uh, mayoral election. Um, I think you as businesses are in quite a good position. If we work on the assumption that the next mayor of London will come from one of the two main parties, either Labour or Conservative, um, which is, may not be the case, but you, if we work on that assumption that it will either be Sadiq Khan for the Labour Party or Zach Goldsmith for the Conservative Party, becomes mayor, I think you're in quite a good place because both those candidates um, have said some quite positive things. So kind of, and, and I should emphasize that I'm not involved in these campaigns in any way, so I'm not seeking to, to influence your vote. But Sadiq Khan has, as I understand it, made some very um, positive noises about uh, business, and he gets London's a thriving uh, uh, economy, and he certainly doesn't want to damage that. And Zach Goldsmith, as I'm sure um, you know, is got impeccable environmental credentials, he's certainly passionate about it, but he's also passionate about, as I understand it, uh, business and making sure that um, uh, uh, business flourishes in London where he's become mayor. So I think you've got two candidates there that are certainly starting in the right place. Um, but they will be influenced by advice from all over the place. It, it really is up to businesses such as those involved with the social stock exchange to engage with them and to really put your argument and, and to put that argument that profit and sustainability can, can be together, can go together. Um, I was asked to mention a, a project that we have at City Hall. Transport for London's Green Bond was issued, uh, was launched this year. I'm told, this is an incredible figure, but I'm, I'm told it's correct that it was launched in April this year, and we've already raised 400 million pounds through that. Um, so I encourage you to look at that as an investment option. I want City Hall to do much more through the stock exchange <coughs> Uh, and I'll be talking to people about how we can do that in practical terms. Um, we've made a great start at City Hall, but I think there's so much more to do in the next few months, and then looking forward to the next mayoral term.